This video is a second part on how to use Lagrangian mechanics to find the equations of motion for a double pendulum. If you didn't watch the previous video, uh, I would suggest you do. The link will, is in the description. Above are the two equations that we will be using. We need two equations because there are two degrees of freedom in a double pendulum. In the previous video, we made the Lagrangian, and in this video, we will use them to find the equations of motion. We will use the equation on the left first, which means that the first thing that we have to find is the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta 1. So looking from left to right, the first theta 1 that I see is in the second term, but if you look inside the parentheses, it will be in the third term that's inside the parentheses, but that whole thing is a part of the second term. So we see that the theta 1 is inside of the cosine function, so we'll have to use the derivative of cosine of theta, which is going to be negative sine of theta. The first thing that I will do is multiply out that term so that you get m2, because 2 times 1 half is 1, m2 times l1 times l2 times theta 1 dot, theta 2 dot, and then the derivative of cosine of theta 1 minus theta 2 is going to be sine of theta 1 minus theta 2, and then I'll attach a minus sign at the front. The next time theta 1 shows up is in the third term of the Lagrangian, and that's pretty easy. You see a cosine, so you know there's going to be a negative in front, so then you know it's going to be m1 g l1 times sine of theta 1, and that whole term is negative. Okay, the next time that you see a theta 1 is in the last term, where you multiply, if you multiply it out, you would get m2 g l1 cosine of theta 1. For that, it's the same exact process as the last one. After you take the derivative, you'll get negative m2 g l1 sine of theta 1. From there, you could factor out a negative g l1 sine of theta 1. After you do so, you will be left with m1 plus m2. So let me just erase all of this, and then I will replace it with its factored form. Next, we have the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta 1 dot. So the first theta 1 dot is in the first term of the Lagrangian, and as you can see, it's just a power rule. You have to multiply the term by 2 and decrease the power by 1, and after you do that, you will get m1 l1 squared theta 1 dot. The next time theta 1 dot shows up is in the second term, and the first term that's inside of the parentheses. It's the same thing as what we just did, instead it's m2. So after you take the derivative, you get m2 l1 squared theta 1 dot. And the last time theta 1 dot shows up is in the second term, but the third term, that's the part inside of the parentheses. That is just a constant multiplied by theta 1 dot, so we just multiply out and then write everything except for the theta 1 dot. After doing all of that, you are left with m2 l1 l2 theta 2 dot cosine of theta 1 minus theta 2. Like we did before, we could also factor things out a bit just to make it cleaner. In the first two terms, you can factor out in L1 squared theta 1 dot. After doing so, you are left with, uh, in parentheses, M1 plus M2 multiplied by L1 squared theta 1 dot. Lastly, we need to take the time derivative of that. In the first term, everything is a constant except for the theta 1 dot, so you keep all the constants the same, and then take the time derivative of theta 1 dot, which is theta 1 double dot. The second term has two things that are not constant, so you need to use the product rule. So I will just factor out all the constants 
in the front just so that they are not there when we take the derivatives. The first part of the product rule is to take the derivative of the first part multiplied by the second part. The derivative of theta2 dot is theta2 double dot and then we multiply by cosine of theta1 minus theta2. For this next part we will have to use a little bit of the chain rule. Still from the product rule you multiply by the first part which is theta2 dot and then multiply by the derivative of cosine of theta1 minus theta2. The derivative of cosine of theta1 minus theta2 is going to be negative sine of theta1 minus theta2, but from the chain rule you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside, so I will multiply by theta1 dot minus theta2 dot. Personally, I like the trig function at the end so that the argument is well known, so I'm just going to change this up a little bit. I'm also going to change the minus sign in the front to a plus sign and then change the theta1 dot minus theta2 dot into a theta2 dot minus theta1 dot. And then I'll multiply by theta2 dot and then multiply by sine of theta1 minus theta2. And I'm just going to quickly switch that. And now we are halfway done. I will just copy the Lagrangian so that I can, so we can, we can do this all again for theta two and theta two dot. Okay, the first thing that we have to do is find the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta two. The first theta two that shows up is in the second term of the Lagrangian but in the third term inside of the parentheses. When you multiply that out, you get that it's equal to m2 times l1, l2, theta1 dot, theta2 dot, times sine of theta1 minus theta2. So the derivative of cosine of theta is negative sine of theta, but Using the chain rule, you have to multiply by the derivative of the inside of the function, which is going to be negative 1. So those two negatives will then cancel out. Next, theta 2 is in the last term of the Lagrangian and the second term inside the parentheses in that term. For that, we just multiply out and change the cosine of theta 2 to a negative sine of theta 2. Next is the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta2 dot. The first theta2 dot is in the second term of the Lagrangian and then the second term inside of those parentheses. From there, it's just the power rule. So you get m2 times l2 squared times theta2 dot. The next occurrence is in the second term again, but in the third term inside of the parentheses. From there, it's just theta2 dot times a bunch of constants. So you get m2 times l1, l2, theta1 dot, cosine of theta1 minus theta2. And lastly, we just have to take the time derivative of all of that. For the first term, it's a bunch of constants times theta2 dot, so we keep the constants and take the time derivative of theta2 dot, which is theta2 double dot. For the next part, we have to use the product rule, so we can take out the constants, factor, factor them out before we do so. So we do the derivative of the first part, which is theta1 double dot, multiplied by the second part, which is cosine of theta1 minus theta2. If you remember last time we did something similar for the next part, I wrote it and then I wrote it the way I like it. So this time I'm just going to write it the way I like it from the beginning. So we start out with theta2 dot minus theta1 dot, which is the time derivative of the inside of the cosine function. Then from there, we multiply by the first part in the product rule, which is the theta1 dot. 
and then multiply by the sine of theta 1 minus theta 2. And that is it. We now have everything we need to make our equations of motion. Now let's write out our final equations. So if we go back to the very beginning, we can find the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta 1. This is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to time of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta 1 dot. And that is one equation down, one to go. Next thing we need is the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta 2. And that is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to time of the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to theta 2 dot. And that is it. These are the two equations that describe the equations of motion for a double pendulum. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Bye.